Okay, this is the uh, exam for review. Uh, we are just one exam away from the final. Uh, and I wanted to go over the areas of emphasis. Uh, the first thing you want to focus on is making sure that you know the acronyms. Because in cardio, there's a number of them, endocrine a few. Uh, but HMG-CoA reductase, 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutaryl coenzyme A reductase enzyme. When you hear HMG-CoA, the first thing you want to think is HMG-CoA uh, reductase inhibitors or um, statins and that's really what this is talking about atorvastatin, simvastatin, those types of drugs. Creatine kinase elevation, this is something that might happen if you have an HMG-CoA and there's an injured muscle going from myopathy all the way to rhabdomyolysis. Uh, percutaneous coronary intervention, it's just a fancy name for a balloon angioplasty or that's one of them, uh, or STEMI or ST elevated MI, uh, myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. Uh, ARB or ARB, angiotensin 2 receptor blocker, these end in sartan. Again, angiotensin 2 is that vasoconstricting enzyme. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. Uh, this is ends with PRIL and again part of the RAS or RAAS system. Uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, you want to break that down into renin then angiotensin 1 and 2, and then aldosterone. What do each of those do? So renin gets you to angiotensin 1, and ACE gets you from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, then you get the vasoconstriction. And then what does aldosterone do to salt and water? And then from that aldosterone, holding on to salt and water, what happens to blood pressure? So if you hold on to salt and water, blood pressure goes up. If you block aldosterone, then you release salt and water, and while blood pressure goes down, you're exchanging for potassium, so potassium will go up. So we want to be careful with that. LDL for low density lipoprotein, the bad cholesterol. HDL is the high density lipoprotein, supposedly the good cholesterol. In some ways, this is directional. We're talking about something that comes from the liver into the bloodstream versus something that goes from the bloodstream back to the liver. Uh, with the nephron, the proximal convoluted tubule, we see a lot of diuresis here and then distal convoluted tubule. We see much less diuresis here because of the distance from the glomerulus. So again, something that's in close proximity is close to you. Something that's distal is distant and far away from you. So the farther away from the glomerulus, uh, the less pressure you have and less diuresis. Okay? And then CCB for calcium channel blocker. Uh, this will be important with hypertension. Okay. Uh, endocrine, just a couple of uh, acronyms that stood out. Phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitor, the sildenafils and tadalafils. I should have you know, underlined uh, this, these stems, letting you know uh, that these are the PDE5 inhibitors. Uh, these are the ones for erectile dysfunction. Um, that DEN is actually a sub stem, but we don't really need to worry about that because there's a vardenafil, a sildenafil that separates it from tadalafil. PTU, propylthiouracil for hyperthyroid, uh, SMVG, so self-monitoring of blood glucose, how we still do it, but uh, the injections are not too bad in terms of the, the size of the needle. They're supposed to be relatively painless, I've heard, but uh, we're starting to get in devices that might be doing this for us. Uh, hemoglobin A1C, that's the way you find out what the last three months of glucose are. It's really helpful to find out um, how the patient has been doing over time. So the first of the cardio chapters is going to be diuretics. And the first thing you want to kind of picture is this water slide where you have the glomerulus, which is a capillary bed, and the nephron. And there are millions of these you know, nephrons in the kidney. And it's a little bit unusual because you have an afferent and efferent arteriole where you would expect arteriole, capillary bed, then venule coming out. Instead, we have two arterioles, the afferent and efferent, so it's a high-pressure system efferent for exit, or just know that they'll both those have an E in it. And you want to know the uses of diuretics at all points of the nephron loop. So the four points that I mean are the proximal convoluted tubule, the, the ascending loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct, which you remember from physiology. Uh, and then what drugs go there. So at the Proximal convoluted tubule, you have the osmotic diuretics at the loop of Henle, you have furosemide at the distal convoluted tubule, the thiazide diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide at the collecting duct, you have spironolactone and triamterene. Uh, and then what the potassium 
uh, level is or what's going on with potassium there. Uh, only one real use for the osmotic diuretics is since uh, reducing intracranial pressure, so mannitol, at that proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, hydrochlorothiazide and furosemide uh, both cause a degree of hypokalemia, furosemide a bit more. Uh, furosemide is notorious for its ototoxicity, um, and so we have to be careful with specific antibiotics that are also ototoxic. Uh, gentamicin comes to mind. Uh, furosemide and DIG, uh, what do you need to add? Well, a big problem with DIG or with heart failure is if you become hypokalemic, it causes real problems. So we want to make sure that we are either adding potassium or something like spironolactone, a potassium sparing diuretic. Uh, spironolactone, that is a potassium sparing diuretic. Um, we use it often with hydrochlorothiazide, but we have to be careful with this gynecomastia. So sometimes, generally with hydrochlorothiazide, we'll see the triamterene instead. Um, diuretic treatment of hypertension versus CHF. So when you have a hypertensive patient, you know, do you need a ton of diuresis? And relative to the CHF, not really. So you would think, okay, hypertension, then I'll add hydrochlorothiazide or something like that. But with CHF, you're talking about getting a lot more fluid off, so you would probably need something like furosemide. So if we're thinking about pitting edema and those kinds of things, furosemide or Lasix is what we're looking at. Uh, the RAS or RAS system, um, it's important to picture what happens when you go from angiotensinogen, the zymogen, to angiotensin 1, then to angiotensin 2, and then what happens to aldosterone. So the ACE inhibitors affect angiotensin converting enzyme as you get from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, and that allows you to stop that vaso uh, vasoconstriction, decreasing blood pressure. But unfortunately, the ACE inhibitors also affect bradykinin. And because of this, um, they can cause cough, and so we get rid of the uh, ACE for the ARB, which doesn't have this effect or this cough effect. We don't treat it as a cough, like with Robitussin or anything. Uh, ACEs and ARBs have specific stems, prills, and sartans. Uh, high potassium and ACE inhibitors and spironolactone, so we want to be careful. Uh, ACE inhibitors are notorious for causing hyperkalemia, as are the potassium-sparing diuretics, spironolactone, and triamterene. Uh, calcium channel blockers. Uh, so the big takeaway is the non-dihydropyridine versus the dihydropyridine uh, to know which is which. Uh, the verapamil uh, and diltiazem are the non-dihydropyridines, and then the dihydropyridines end in dipine, D-I-P-I-N-E, so the amlodipine, nifedipine. Why is it important? Because the non-dihydropyridines specifically affect the heart, and so that means that we have issues like verapamil and digoxin, where we might have issues with AV block, and verapamil specifically is the worst for constipation. Why does that make sense? Well, if you're talking about calcium channels and blocking them, then you're talking about the calcium that goes into muscles as well. Uh, and if you want to think of the GI as a muscle, uh, you can think of that slowing because of the blockade. Uh, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers like nifedipine. Um, in some ways, calcium channel blockers and beta blockers work similarly, so you don't necessarily want to see them together. And then nifedipine uh, also has another use, uh, stopping or slowing uh, uterine contractions as well. Uh, but definitely no difference between dihydropyridine and non-dihydropyridine as it affects the heart or it just vasodilates like the dihydropyridines. Hypertension, so what is primary hypertension uh, versus secondary? Uh, no, some you know, those, you know, kind of tie in a top end uh, side effects. With alpha blockers, that orthostatic hypertension, so you get this rapid vasodilation, which is called first dose syncope or first dose fainting. So we think of Okay, well, how can we solve that? Well, we give HS or at the hour of sleep dosing, you know, bedtime dosing. Um, sometimes uh, you'll see two separate classes, like thiazides and beta blockers, when you're going to treat hypertension, so we don't use two of the same class. Uh, diabetic patient, we might see an ACE inhibitor because it's kidney protective. Uh, and then when we look at enalapril, an ACE inhibitor, we want to be careful because we might have hyperkalemia from that, and then... Uh, because of this decreased aldosterone release. So again, we want to be very aware of uh, what's going on with uh, the potassium and sodium exchange uh, at the kidney. Uh, beta blockade, so know the first, second, third generation beta blockers. First generation is going to be uh, beta 1 and beta 2. Uh, so they really don't want to give that with an asthmatic. Uh, 
Uh, second generation is going to be beta-1 selective, and then third generation affects beta-1, beta-2, but also alpha receptors. So just as the body is going to compensate to vasoconstrict as uh, the beta blocker is you know, decreasing heart rate, uh, the carvedilol or something like that, which affects alpha and beta-1, um, kind of takes care of that by vasodilating and reducing heart rate to try to maintain lower blood pressure. Uh, CHF, so what's the appropriateness of furosemide? Um, when do we use it? Uh, spironolactone mechanism of action for increasing HF survival or heart failure survival and note uh, the gynecomastia incidence rate of around 10%. Signs and symptoms of ditch toxicity, those halos and things like that. And then the thyroid diuretics, uh, watching out for hypokalemia, especially with digoxin. Uh, cholesterol, so we're talking about uh, LDL and coronary heart disease risks. Um, some notes. Uh, so uh, we want to, what is it that um, causes these, the risk factors, and you can look at the Framingham score or something like that, and it says, okay, over the next 10 years, what are the chances something really bad is going to happen? Um, usually we want to see an LDL cholesterol lowering somewhere in the four to six week range, and we're really watching out, especially with the statins, for this rhabdomyolysis, which is usually preceded by some kind of myopathy, some kind of muscle pain. Uh, the creatine kinase is often an indicator of this myopathy or rhabdomyolysis. And then uh, if we want to use some other things for cholesterol, uh, niacin, somebody maybe can't afford the statins or things like that, wants something over the counter. Uh, niacin over the counter is available, but it can cause this flushing and just uh, an aspirin a half hour before can help with that. Uh, the newer drugs, alarocumab and evolocumab, uh, the proluent and repatha, they're, it's a little bit uh, extended, but the proprotein convertase subtilisin, kexin type 9, the PCSK9 inhibitors. And um, this is for resistant elevated LDL. This is a big kind of thing with medicines these days is that, you know, so a patient uh, pays for their health insurance, but then the health insurance company gets a bill for $80,000 for the drug. And, you know, how much is too much? Uh, and we're actually kind of battling right now with something similar. Uh, but uh, that's really um, as much as, you know, knowing that, okay, this drug can do a good job, can extend the patient's life. Um, what, is, what is the actual uh, issue that's going on with actually getting the drug? Can we even get the drug to them? Uh, angina, so uh, nitrates uh, are both for stable and variant angina, but beta blockers are only for stable angina. Why? And calcium channel blockers are both for stable and variant. What's the big difference there? And if we think about it, we think about variant angina as kind of a spastic happening. Then you think of nitrate and how nitrate can kind of calm that uh, spasm, as can the calcium channel blockers, but beta blockers have no effect on that kind of uh, spasticity. And then renolazine, for the price, uh, we weren't really seeing as much benefit as we would like. Uh, nitroglycerin, so this dilates the veins, uh, putting a little less work on the heart. Uh, know that the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, the sildenafils, uh, the Viagras, and nitroglycerin just do not mix. Uh, what kind of mechanism of action are we looking are at with nitrous oxide and so forth? And then uh, when we administer it, and we're, we're talking about an emergency where the patient has angina and they have their small nitroglyc nitroglycerin bottle, what do they do? And the previous uh, the recommendation was five minutes, five minutes. Uh, you take one after five minutes, you take another one after five minutes. If there's no relief, then you call 911. But now it's you take one after five minutes and you call 911. But make sure they sit down because uh, these will knock them down pretty uh, quickly. Um, beta blocker doesn't work uh, with angina and variant. I talked about that. Uh, Verapamil, it's good for coronary spasms, not stable angina. And that's really talking again about the, um, you know, talking about the calcium blockade and the muscles and so forth. Uh, what types of angina do we have in the treatments? Uh, and I went over that with the beta blockers. Uh, know the difference between anticoagulants, antiplatelets, and the clot busters. When do we use them? So an anticoagulant like warfarin, antiplatelet like aspirin or clopidogrel, clot buster like alteplase, something there's a clot now and we have to break through it. Uh, so gemfibrozil and warfarin, what kind of interaction are we going to have? Are we going to have induction? Are we going to have you know, inhibition? Uh, speed of an action, 
how quickly do these work? So something like enoxaparin, how quickly does that work versus aspirin versus warfarin versus tissue plasminogen activator? Uh, warfarin versus the clot busters versus antiplatelets versus heparin, the speed of action is kind of the same. Uh, heparin overdose, uh, so we've got to watch out for hemorrhage, uh, especially heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And how does that usually um, manifest? And we're going to see some kind of decreased blood pressure, tachycardia, even lumbar pain. Uh, enoxaparin versus heparin, so what are the properties that are better of enoxaparin versus heparin? So in general, enoxaparin you can take at home uh, versus the heparin which has to be done in the hospital. And uh, the heparin, while the drug itself is a lot cheaper than enoxaparin, the hospital stay is not. Uh, what's the interaction between carbamazepine and warfarin? So warfarin, uh, do we have to, where, where do we have to adjust? Do we have to adjust up, down? Which drug do we have to adjust? Uh, clopidogrel and dark tarry stool. So uh, something like this where we have an antiplatelet, how do we know that we maybe uh, have some issues with bleeding and things like that? Uh, understanding heparin overdose, again, help, um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and understanding those couple warfarin interactions. Obviously, there's just so, tons of tons of uh, warfarin interactions. Uh, SD-elevated MI, what are the first drugs that we give? You know, why do we give an aspirin right away? Why would it make sense to give a beta blocker if you want to? Uh, why does it make sense to give nitroglycerin? Uh, so again, uh, looking at mechanism of action, so something like aspirin, you know, making the platelets not sticky. Beta blockers reducing the work on the heart because if it's having the heart's having an MI, it might freak out and start you know going really tachycardic. Nitroglycerin reducing the load by uh, opening up the veins, taking some of the work off it. Morphine because it's really painful uh, to have a heart attack, uh, and also calming. And then oxygen get better oxygenation. Uh, again, when to give a beta blocker: bradycardia versus tachycardia, uh, causes of hyper and hypokalemia, how they affect the heart and how that relates to digitoxicity. Uh, endocrine starts here. So what is it about diabetes and beta blockers? We have some masking of the tachycardia that a patient might feel. Really with diabetes, why are we trying to do all this? And it's the micro and macrovascular complications that we're trying to avoid. When you think of micro, you're thinking about the little blood vessels in the eyes and things like that. Macrovascular, of course, we're talking about heart disease and things. Uh, so uh, very tough to manage a diabetic patient, but uh, really what the end point is and that you can't feel immediately is this vascular complications. Uh, how often do we monitor pregnant patients? So we're talking about five, six, seven times a day uh, that we're going to check blood glucose. What are the normal ranges for blood glucose? So around the 126. Hemoglobin A1C, how does that differ from normal monitoring? And that's over the last three months, how this, how's the patient doing? Um, how does regu regular insulin differ from something like insulin glargine? So in regular insulin can be put on a sliding scale. If your blood glucose is this, then we dose this much regular insulin. Uh, insulin glargine, of course, is uh, that long-acting lantus. Uh, know the four insulins, the four insulin mountains. So uh, the Humalog, how quickly it peaks versus something like insulin glargine, which has a much longer profile. Uh, ketoacidosis versus hyperosmolar syndrome. Uh, what are the th signs and symptoms that we're going to see that are different? Uh, thyroid, so thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, if thyroid stimulating hormone is high, why does that mean someone's hypothyroid? And that means that the body's trying to stimulate, but it's just not happening. And then if thy thyroid stimulating hormone is low, that means the body has enough thyroid and it doesn't really need to uh, make it. So it's a little bit inverse to what you might think intuitively. Uh, hyperthyroid, what's it like? So Graves' disease, ex ophthalma, so X out, and then ophthalmus eye, so the eyes bulging out. Plumber's disease, toxic nodular goiter, so we don't have that ex ophthalmus. Uh, signs and symptoms, so with hyperthyroid, we have that rapid heart rate and that nervousness. Um, the treatment is usually to make them hypothyroid by removing the thyroid or destroying it with radioactive iodine. If we can't do those things, we may suppress it in the meantime with something like PTU, propylthiouracil. Uh, hypothyroid, so we add thyroid hormone uh, once they're hypothyroid and uh, levothyroxine um, and the brand name, of course, synthetic thyroid. Uh, that's where synthroid comes from. Uh, just like thyroid, just like uh, diabetes, we're just talking about too much or too little of something. So too much adrenal hormone, we're talking about Cushing's and 
We may need to remove the diseased adrenal gland where we have too little adrenal hormone. Uh, we talked about Addison's disease and maybe replacement therapy. Uh, non endocrine uses of glucocorticoids. So what you want to do is kind of check these two boxes, inflammation and immune. So if you have rheumatoid arthritis, is that an inflammatory condition? Yes. Is that an immune condition, autoimmune condition? Yes. Systemic lupus erythematosus, is it an inflammation? Yes. Is it an autoimmune? Yes. And rheumatoid part of SLE, not sometimes. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, same thing, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, is it inflammation? Yes. Is it immune? Yes. Uh, allographic rejection, now we're talking about organ donation, things like that, or organ transfer. And not really an inflammatory condition, but we don't want the immune system to reject the new, new uh, organ. Uh, respiratory distress syndrome, uh, we use this antenatal uh, use where mom gets a couple injections of steroid uh, to help improve the neonate's lung function. For every course of steroid, uh, the double injection, uh, you get about a week and that actually makes a huge difference. Uh, when we're talking about uh, preemies, my kiddos were 27 weeks, three days. So uh, it was very important to their surviving. Uh, adverse effects, so adrenal insufficiency. When you give too much steroid, then the body says, all right, well, I don't have to make any. Uh, and you get adrenal insufficiency. Hyperglycemia. If you want to think that with fight or flight, so once you le release those steroids, it's telling the body, hey, we're going to go fight. So we need a lot of glucose, so you're going to raise it and put it all in the bloodstream. Um, steroids are notorious for infection, and over the long term, if you're going to suppress the immune system, then you're opening up the infection. And then there's a mechanism for the osteoporosis where uh, a long-term glucocorticoid use actually makes the bones weaker. Uh, birth control. So we just want to make sure that we can recognize which one's an estrogen, which one's a progestin, uh, how do the numbers work uh, with progestin versus uh, estrogen in terms of milligram dosages and things like that? I won't ask you the actual milligram dosages, but I expect you to know which is the progestin, which is the estrogen, uh, and uh, what kind of courses would we see? Um, can we have an estrogen only? Can we have a progestin only? So, you know, progestin only, like norethindrone. It might be a little bit less effective, might cause some bleeding, but um, definitely a little better uh, in terms of some of the side effect profile. Uh, what are the long acting ones? Something like Implanon that you can implant or the emergency um, contraceptive levonogestrel, uh, the plan B one step, which is over the counter. Uh, erectile dysfunction and benign prostatic hyperplasia. So what's the difference between the dosing schedules? You got something like sildenafil, which is you know PRN or Tadalafil, uh, which could be once daily or PRN. Uh, dosing with food, uh, what kind of absorption delay do we have with these high fat meals? Uh, Half-life, uh, why does sildenafil or Viagra work much differently uh, than Tadalafil, uh, which is uh, much longer acting, Cialis. Uh, duration of action, so around four hours versus 36. Uh, and then what, what, how does the metabolism affect uh, any interactions? So we're talking about the CYP3A4 system. Uh, alpha blockers, we wanna use uh, with caution, uh, except Tamsulosin, uh, that seems to be okay. Uh, because it doesn't really have that um, vasodilatory issue uh, as the other alphas do. Uh, BPH, so uh, the big the big two classes that we see are the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So they decrease dihydrotestosterone. They decrease the prostate size, and it takes months for these to work. You have the tutasteride, which is Avidart, finasteride, which is Proscar, but they are teratogenic to a male fetus. Uh, alpha-1 blockers, they work really quickly. Um, they relax the smooth muscle and... Uh, provide relief very quickly. So Tamsulosin, uh, Flomax, Alfuzosin, Uroxitrol, uh, those both are going to have very little effect on uh, blood pressure, whereas doxazosin is actually used uh, as a blood pressure lowering drug and might not be something that we prefer. So we would see that hypotension because of the vasodilation, especially with something like doxazosin or Cardora. And that is it.